Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar on teaching statistics online, approaches, strategies, and technologies, which is sponsored by NES, National Institute of Statistical Sciences. I am Ezra Kurum from Department of Statistics at University of California, Riverside, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. So today we have three experts in teaching statistics online, and they will provide strategies and methods for online teaching, and they will also give us a review of helpful technologies. So here's, oops, here's our schedule for today. So we have uh, Dr. John Hobrick from Penn State University, uh, Kristen San Sanani from Stanford, and our last speaker is Melinda Clardy from South Louisiana Community College. Each of our speakers will have 20 minutes for their presentations, and at the end we will have questions from you to our speakers. So let me go over the logistics for today's webinar. Our hosts are James Rosenberger and Glenn Johnson, and all our attendees are view only, but we encourage you to submit your questions to our speakers. In order to do so, you can click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom window, type in your question, and then click enter. And a couple of uh, information about the Zoom settings. When a speaker is sharing his or her screen, you can minimize the video of other speakers by clicking on the speaker view and gallery view at the top of your Zoom window. And then after the completion of this webinar, you will receive a brief survey. And these evaluations are very important to NIST and we thank you in advance for providing your feedback through this survey. A link of the recording of the session as well as links to the speaker's slides will be available at NIST.org within a day or so. And then with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. John Hobrick from Penn State Department of Statistics, who is uh, an instructional designer and assistant teaching professor at Penn State Department of Statistics, where in addition to teaching, he also supports the teaching and design of the online statistics courses. Prior to joining the statistics department, John was an instructional designer for Penn State's World Campus. He has experience in teaching face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online classes in both high school and college levels. Today, John will be sharing his experiences in teaching large classes online. And with that, I'll turn the mic to John. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Hopefully uh, you can see my, my slide there now. Um, so as Ezra said, I, I'm an assistant teaching professor, but I also, my, my primary duties a lot of my time is spent as the instructional designer with our online courses um, in the department. Um, if you've never seen our online course notes, we have 23 online undergraduate and graduate notes that are open on the web, uh, but enough about that. Anyhow, um, teaching large classes um, in any format is challenging. Uh, the scale alone places some limits on um, how you can structure the class. So when moving these classes remotely, we're faced with even more challenges since most of us we don't have the appropriate time or support to actually build an online course, which often takes a year of development. Um, I'm currently teaching a class of intro statistics with, uh, with 320 students. And I, I've taught intro statistics like in almost every format, um, but this will be my first time really with, uh, except for the end of last semester, end of spring, um, having this many students in a remote asynchronous um, format. Uh, so when trying to decide on what to share today, I was thinking of what is the most efficient way to deliver a quality experience for large classes that were moved to online in a, in a short amount of time. Um, these suggestions are in no way a, a complete guide to designing a course, um, and I'm not endorsing any particular tools either, so nobody's paying me. Um, so it'd be impossible for me to offer tips or tricks that, that kind of work in all situations, um, courses, technology, et cetera, but, but it's my hope that you kind of come away with understanding of the importance of closing the distance by being present, and, and I'll kind of go over that here in a little bit. Um, I have a feeling you're going to hear a lot of the same information in the other pre presenters as well, because good teaching online really works across all class sizes. I saw this on uh, LinkedIn yesterday, and I, I thought it was very appropriate um, for these days. Okay, let's do a quick poll, kind of get an idea of, uh, of who's here in the audience. Raise your Zoom hand if you teach face-to-face -face classes with over 100 students. If you have the ability to do that there. 
webinar settings. Okay, raise your hand if you teach online with classes with over 100 students. Okay, we have some, good. All right, without going into a lot of boring details, um, I wanted to share a little theory to kind of set the stage regarding online courses. And, and one theory regarding student learning in online courses is called the transactional distance theory. We already know that large classes are not as intimate and that you and the students can feel very distant. Um, the old adage of students is, oh, I'm just a number. So moving to class online can either increase or decrease this distance depending on how you structure it. Um, and, and how it's run. And you can see in the model that more dialogue actually decreases this distance. Okay, dialogue with the students. Um, and for instance, to also help you kind of interpret this complicated, there's a lot of moving parts here to this model. Think about a MOOC, a massive open online course. They're extremely high on the transactional distance because they have a lot of structure, they have very little dialogue. And it, pure autonomy is needed to take the course. Usually there's no instructor really even doing much behind the scenes. Um, that's, so a MOOC might be very high transactional distance course. Um, so how do we shrink that to make it feel smaller? And because we know what the completion rates look like in those MOOCs, um, which this could be one of the reasons, obviously there's, there's others as well. So I wanna focus on closing that transactional distance gap through another framework called the Community of Inquiry. Uh, which focuses on three types of presence in the online course, the social, the cognitive, and the teaching present. So the, the question is, how can we be present while still main, maintaining some sort of sanity and work-life balance? And, uh, you know, many people are finding this to be, uh, this to be overwhelming uh, at, at this point. So let's start, let's take a look at each one of these. Uh, I'm gonna start with social presence in an online course. Um, this would include everything you do that shows you're not a robot. Um, and, and being involved right from the start is a good way to do that. Um, you know, during an in-person class, I was kind of thinking about this, students are familiar with the building or they're familiar with the layout of the room um, or they, they know where the door is at, they know where the desk are at, they know where the board's at. So students come to class and can focus on the content or how the class works. Now we're asking them to enter a different environment, like a learning management system, like Canvas or Blackboard, that doesn't have much consistency from one class to another. So now the student's attention is going from how to find things as opposed to learning about the course. So you're losing some of their, their cognitive ability. Um, this is why it's important to be, be involved early on. Um, Here's where also you let your teaching personality shine. Um, be real. You know, obviously uh, with technical issues and things like that and, and knowing maybe sharing that, hey, you're working from home too if you are. Um, do you, if you use humor in the classroom, you know, like the cause cartoons and songs or, you know, have a Friday fun portion of your discussion board, um, somehow to kind of get that personality um, around, but also just, just being there and, 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 you know, having that introduction form maybe uh, where you introduce yourself and the students can introduce themselves as well, um, which obviously you're not going to be able to respond to everybody because, you know, limitations of large class, but at least, you know, it, it's out there. So some of the tech tools, um, you know, the first tools in most cases is just going to be your LMS, uh, your learning management system. It's, it's not always the best or most exciting tool, all right? However, it is typically one students are familiar with. And again, it comes down to that. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to suggest tech tools since that's part of the title of my talk, but you'll notice my recommendations are usually bland. Um, I believe in using the minimal amount of technology in order to achieve your desired outcome. Uh, also, if you're using a tool for one thing, see if it can be used for something else. Um, think about things like ease of use, um, the tool support, the accessibility of it, um, of any tool that you introduce. Because in large classes, say you have 10% of your class has technical issues with the tool. Well, if you have a class of 300, now you're looking at 30 issues coming in and, and, and lots of problems. So um, 
but the big thing here is that to make that social presence, uh, probably the biggest thing is having a discussion forum of some sort. You do not want to have, you want to have a place where students can go to ask you and other students and to share with other students. Um, you do not want to have all of these questions coming in via email. I don't know if any of you um, in the spring noticed if you, when you went remote, if you went remote, all of a sudden an influx of emails, individual emails from students. And uh, so I think that's important to have something, a place like that set up in your courses. Um, I think it's also important to note that how you set your notifications um, in the many systems, you know, decide what you want to be notified immediately about and what you can put off until, you know, you can check it later. The next type of presence uh, is the community of inquiry. In the community of inquiry is the cognitive presence. This is where you insert your expertise um, and invite, you know, and set up the course for deeper learning. This is easy with in-person classes because you can ask questions right there on the spot to push the students to deeper thinking. And you can immediately see how the students are feeling and, you know, getting that, getting that feedback. Online, you can do the same, but with a little more planning. Um, you know, use a discussion forum to ask these types of questions or, um, you know, and, and participate in these discussions and ask, ask probing questions in there. Um, providing more questions as opposed to just uh, giving the answers. Um, you can ask polls in your live sessions uh, to keep students thinking and engaged with, with the student. Um, also provide opportunities for students to kind of reflect on their own learning. And, you know, one way of doing that, obviously getting 320 journal assignments might not be ideal, um, but frequent formative assessments such as they could just be simple stop and check quizzes. Um, that give immediate feedback to the student that are, you know, closed questions. It kind of gives, gives the ability of students to kind of monitor their own progress, you know, at a very low stakes environment. Um, but it really comes down to, at this point, cognitive part, online, make your thinking visible. Um, and, and online, we can do that. And we can also even, you know, obviously make things required. So how how can we frequently assess students, like I just mentioned with like formative assessments and actually provide meaningful feedback? Um, one method is, uh, I already talked about was the automatically graded short quizzes. Um, obviously they're not ideal for assessment, but they do cut the time down between the time the student submits the assignment and the feedback they get, which when you cut that time down, have to help facilitates the learning. Um, you know, and, and leverage the built-in feedback capabilities of your LMS quizzing tools, like in Canvas that we have, have, you can add feedback for both correct and incorrect answers um, that can be given to students right away or at a specified date. You can type this in once, you can type this feedback in once and now all of your students will see it whenever they take the, the quiz as opposed to trying to provide that same feedback to 300 students um, individually. So along with feedback, um, another tool could be used with rubrics, um, especially if you have more open-ended things like projects, etc. The rubrics can allow you oftentimes to be point and click it already puts the comments in there that you most likely are going to say. It puts the expectations uh, for students and um, they can be applied to, you know, the small projects or journal reviews, reflections, or, or even discussion participation if you want to grade that. Um, but it's a way to make it much quicker uh, when grading. Also, you can use polling um, like we can do obviously in Zoom. Um, but you can do it also, you know, asynchronously in your, like, like Piazza has a, ability to, to create polls. You could uh, make Google Forms, Microsoft Forms, Qualtrics, et cetera, and put those in your, uh, put those in your LMS for students to, uh, to respond to. The final presence in the um, Community of Inquiry framework is the teaching presence. And to differentiate from the cognitive presence, um, the teaching presence is more, um, it's more on the administrator or facilitator side of the course. However, the two are really not mutually exclusive. There is some overlap. So this, this kind of presence would be where you set up the syllabus and you set up the learning environment. And I wanna highlight a couple of these. Um, first, set your expectations for responsiveness. You know, when dealing with this many students, this, possibly this many emails, um, you might not be able to respond within, you know, a couple of minutes. It might take 12 hours, might take 24 hours. Um, but I think the most important thing is having or setting the expectation. The students know what to expect and you're sticking to those um, and you're meeting those expectations, chances are they're gonna respect those boundaries. Um, you might run into 
for instance, telling the students, don't ask me content questions through e individual emails, put them in the discussion forums. And early on in the course, you're going to keep getting emails or you keep getting emails. And eventually you just need to politely remind them, you know, put this on the um, discussion board and, and be clear that uh, you're not going to answer content questions and eventually stick to that. And then they'll figure it out. And hopefully they realize that once they go to the discussion forum, they're able to get a lot more uh, quicker, usually quicker feedback from, from not only you, but also the classmates. Um, some other class design ideas that, to kind of make the class feel smaller for the student would be, for instance, using peer feedback um, to help with grading. Um, if you're putting up, if you're checking, maybe, maybe you're submitting uh, homework assignments and, you know, but they're open-ended students are either writing out their equations and things and, and, and their theories or proofs and putting them on a Word document and then scanning it and uploading it. Um, you obviously don't have time to, all, to give feedback to all of that, but you could have your uh, peers do that. Um, or maybe they peer review two other ones throughout the week. Um, you could use student groups for discussions or assignments. Um, that cuts down on the total number of, of products to grade, but it also gives the students an opportunity to work with others in a small group setting. Um, I think what you'll notice at times, um, whether you're using Slack or Teams or whatever, a lot of times your bigger communities where there's a lot of people, there's actually less conversation than if there was a smaller community. Um, you know, a smaller group of people. So you can, you know, like in Piazza discussion forums, you can uh, make groups, student groups. Uh, so now the students are only really uh, replying to a few people and, and, and feel much more comfortable uh, putting that out there. Um, for teaching new information, you could try, you know, pre-made videos as opposed to having a live lectures, because what that could do for you is it allows you more time in the live time to if you if you have live synchronous sessions to take questions or have you know have the students work through problems together or you working through you know providing a problem and everybody's working together you could have set up some polls um, or other feedback mechanisms as well so the the teaching part is really uh, setting that environment in the atmosphere for learning and the structure that you're giving you know the in the modern we talk about the tech tools to do this. The modern LMS has a lot of tools that can help facilitate quickly and efficiently working with large courses. Um, I know one of my favorites, uh, Canvas has the ability to message students who out of the gradebook who didn't submit, did submit, um, scored above a certain mark or below. And what it would do is send a Canvas email directly to all students who met that condition. But it looks like an individual message from you. It doesn't have everybody's name on it. So I like to send the, so you send one message out and all of a sudden, you know, anybody who hasn't submitted yet, um, whether it be 80 people get an individual email from you after you just typed it once. And when they reply back, it only goes back to you. All right, so if the student does need, need to talk further. Um, I like to do these early on in the course to make sure students are really getting on pace and getting up to going and nobody's falling behind early on. I mean, after a while, you, you know, I wouldn't do these as often. Um, but, but to get students on pace early, those types of tools are really good to use. Um, the other one I want to highlight here is the setting up their navigational structure of the learning management system. Um, you know, do you have a landing page with immediate relevant information? Um, do they know where to go next when they go into your space? Um, do they know where to find the syllabus or where to get help? Um, we can address uh, or get in front of a lot of student questions and a lot of student issues um, were things that you used to just solve in that first class or second class when you're there talking live and, and you realize what the students' questions are. Now we have to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more explicit, a little bit more thorough with the online portion of the course and, and what students are seeing because that's where they're going to now to find out about their course and how it works. You know, another way to think about the online environment is this quick analogy. Um, kind of a, comparing a compass to a, uh, to a GPS. You know, a compass is going to point you in the direction, um, but you still need to know what direction you want to go. Whereas a GPS will, you know, they'll give you every turn and guides you to exactly how to arrive at your destination. So with the online classes, especially large ones with lots of questions and, and moving parts, when it comes to the policies, logistics of your course, how it works, you want to be very, you want to be very uh, 
explicit about it, provide that GPS, make that part of the course easy so that their cognition and, and cognitive load is spent on uh, the content itself and not just trying to find a syllabus. So kind of my biggest takeaways are, um, you know, closing the distance, that transactional distance um, to make it feel more uh, like a smaller course so the student um, does feel more comfortable. Um, be present in the course and leverage tools to do, th do so, so that it doesn't tax you um, and, and spend too much of your time. And also, uh, you know, make their thinking visible. So somehow try to get, you know, whether it be through polls or, or whatever, tr uh, try to get their, their thinking out there so that you're able to uh, get that feedback that you normally would have in that live classroom. All right, so you can add your questions, uh, as was gonna, uh, or explained earlier about the um, uh, Q&A, as well as we'll have time at the end uh, to take any questions. So for now, that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John. This was very informative, uh, especially I didn't know about the transactional distance theory. That was very informative. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Kristen Sainani, who is an associate uh, professor at Stanford University. Kristen teaches statistics and writing and writes about health, science, and statistics for a range of audiences. She is the statistical editor for the journal Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And in addition, in this journal, she also writes this statistics column titled Statistically Speaking. Uh, she teaches the massive open online course writing in the sciences on Coursera. And she was the recipient of the 2018 Biosciences Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching at Stanford University. Kristen teaches all her courses in a flipped classroom format. And today she will give us tips and tools on how to adapt our, on our classes for online and remote teaching. Kristen? Thanks, Ezra. Can everybody see my screen? That's okay. Yes. Great, okay. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. So I am gonna um, transition into some specific tips and tools and just to give you some ideas for what you might do in your fall courses. Uh, my first piece of advice is, I'm actually going to reiterate something that John just said, was uh, don't be a robot. <laughs> Interject humor into everything that you can, because we are all in this challenging time right now. So adding a little bit of levity, showing that you're a real person can really go a long way to make uh, students feel comfortable. My kids pop into my lecture sometimes. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I just had to share this cartoon because I absolutely love this cartoon. Um, I'm going to start here with a little bit of a bigger picture perspective. I have been in academia a long time, probably a lot longer than some of you. Um, and, you know, when I went to college, the primary mode of delivery for, um, for you know, the primary technology for delivering lectures was the good old-fashioned chalkboard. And by the time I hit graduate school in the late 1990s, we'd maybe moved to some whiteboards. Uh, another popular mode of delivering lectures uh, in my time, some of you may be old enough to remember these, uh, is the good old fashioned uh, overhead slide projector. And actually as a graduate student, I taught an entire undergraduate course using overhead projector slides. And that was considered great at the time because you didn't have to write your notes on the board. You could just photocopy the notes. Uh, as a graduate student, I also used the uh, old fashioned slide projector to give presentations. Because back then, if you wanted to show pretty pictures, that's how you did it with the slide projector. Um, around the time I was graduating from graduate school and starting to teach, that's when uh, PowerPoint made its debut. So I'm old enough to remember that transition. And uh, I remember that there was actually a lot of resistance to PowerPoint. It was going to ruin education as we know it. Um, but of course, that became the predominant technology for delivering lectures eventually. Um, and then what we've seen in the last maybe 10 years is the rise of online uh, education technology. And this is predominantly just due to the fact that we now have great computing bandwidth. So 15 years ago, you could not pre-record all your lectures and put them online. There just wasn't the bandwidth. Now we have the bandwidth to do that. And so my view on all of this is this is just another step in education technology. This is just increasing our toolkit uh, for delivering education. Uh, a little bit of where I'm coming from, my background. So I got involved in massive open online courses very early on. 
I posted one of the early courses on Coursera on scientific writing. I also had an early course on uh, statistics on Stanford Online. And uh, I did this very deliberately when I was taping the videos for the MOOCs, I knew that I was gonna use the same videos to flip my Stanford classes. So I started by flipping my scientific writing and intro stats courses at Stanford. And that was uh, successful. Um, so I spent the next year and a half flipping my advanced stats courses at Stanford as, as well. And I, I'm a big fan of the flipped classroom. And the reason being is that the things I teach, which is writing and applied statistics, are not things that you learn in a lecture. These are things that you learn by doing. So the flipped classroom emphasizes that doing part. And what do we do in the classroom? We um, you know, talk about examples from the news or do some data analysis, or my TA and I spend a lot of time running around the room doing code diagnosis, because that turns out to be one of the biggest frustrations for students in stats courses is getting stuck on code. So we can help ease some of that frustration by diagnosing those errors in class. Um, Flip Classroom also frees up time to do some really cool projects. And so in one of my undergraduate courses, we did community service data analysis. So we partnered with two community partners who had data, uh, and we analyzed those data together as a class um, for those community partners. It was a ton of work for my TA and I, but I have to say it really gave the students a sense of how statistics could be used to do good in the real world. Now, like all of you though, currently in 2020, I am facing a new challenge, which is I have to adapt all of my in-class components to remote learning. So I'm in the same boat as all of you right now. So I highly recommend, if you can, to think about pre-recording some of your lectures. Um, something like statistics, it's often for the didactic material, it's often easier for students to watch those lectures at their own pace, and those pre-recorded lectures allow them to do that. So if you can, I know not everybody has the capacity to do that before the fall, but if you can pre-tape some of the lectures, it can be really helpful. Now, just some tips for pre-recording lectures. So uh, one thing is, it's not a great idea to just take the lectures you've always given in the classroom and then just deliver them over Zoom and press record. Um, the pre-recorded lectures need to be broken up into smaller chunks. And so, for example, when I went to build my MOOCs initially, I used to teach like an hour and a half stats lecture. It was rather meandering. <laughs> and what I had to do for the MOOCs was to figure out what are the concepts that I want to teach and then what, what am I actually talking about in this lecture and I broke it down and it really helped make my lectures actually a lot more organized. Um, I was given a lot of advice when I started doing the MOOCs like you know people cannot they do not have an attention span longer than six minutes so you shouldn't make a video longer than six minutes. I did not follow any of those rules and I really don't think you need to follow any kind of hard and fast rules like that. I highly recommend for statistics, when you are writing equations, to have a stylus and to write on the screen if you have that uh, technology. It's really, really helpful. It makes taping those lectures a lot easier to just be able to write out the math. Uh, I like to include a lot of pause the video exercises in my pre-recorded lectures. So I will put up a problem and then I will tell the students to pause the video, try it on their own, and then restart the video and I will walk through the answer. Uh, I think it helps to keep the students engaged that they have to actually sit back and, and try a problem halfway through the video. I also like to follow each video with an easy online quiz, just some kind of auto-graded multiple choice that they get some immediate feedback, again, just to keep them engaged. Another thing I've had a lot of success with is I like to do what I call how-to or demo videos, and these are made sort of in the spirit of uh, when you have to build Ikea furniture, you probably are all familiar with those incomprehensible manuals they send you. I, I can't make heads or tails of those manuals, so what do I do? I go on to YouTube and I look for a video where somebody is building that furniture in real time. That's a lot easier for me to follow. So I've made these kind of demo videos in the same spirit. Um, so for example, I do these uh, statistics demo videos. And what I do is I walk through a data analysis from start to finish. And of course, I have pre-analyzed those data. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm walking the students through the steps and through my thought process. So here's how I cleaned the data. Here's the descriptive statistics. Uh, here's how, here's the question I'm trying to answer. And here's how I tried to, you know, what tests I used and why, and sort of walking through the output. These are 50 minute videos. 50 minutes plus, so I wasn't sure if it would be well received, but I've actually gotten a lot of positive feedback on these that it really helps students to unpack the black box of what happens in a data analysis. I do a similar thing in my writing course where I take 500 word essays, 
and I edit them in real time. Now, of course, again, I have pre-edited those essays. I know the changes I'm going to make, but I come into the video booth and I start with the original essay and I go through line by line and make the changes and I talk students through why I'm making those changes. Again, those, essay, those videos are very long, um, but I've gotten a lot of positive feedback that students like to see that thought process and see how I approach editing and writing. Um, I want to reiterate something that John said was that, you know, you don't need to use the most fancy technology to do pre-recording of your lectures. You can just go on to Zoom, you know, click record and just tape yourself talking over PowerPoint or over, you know, your, your uh, whiteboard. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but if you did want to get a little bit more fancy with the video editing, I have a list here of tools. Uh, you don't need to scribble these down. We're going to provide the slides and the links afterwards. But here are some, some tools that are available. There are a lot of tools out there. I use Camtasia for, for just basic video editing, but some of these tools also allow you to um, put special effects and uh, you know, do animations if you want to get really fancy. The link at the bottom here is that one of my colleagues pointed me out to a YouTube video that shows how to do a do-it-yourself uh, light board. And so you can actually write on the board uh, with you in the background. Um, and so that there's all sorts of cool ideas out there. Now, I realize that some of you are not going to pre-record the lectures and you're going to be doing your lectures synchronously. Um, and it just so happens, though, that though I usually pre-record all my lectures, I teach one summer course that's a two-week uh, summer course. Um, it's a summer career course, uh, and I teach it with some co-instructors, and we've done this for about five years. And this year, we decided to continue with the course, but remotely, and we did not pre-record the lecture. So, I have this recent experience where I learned some things about delivering a remote lectures synchronously. So just some tips for that. So one thing that we learned on day one is that we've been giving this class for a while. It was not a good idea to just take those lectures that we've been giving for the last five years and just deliver them over Zoom. That was a total flop. Um, so you need to really think about breaking those lectures into smaller segments and interspersing with some interactive exercises like John talked about polls and things. That can help you know, keep it lively for the students. We did things like you know, build word clouds. I'll show you some more examples of interactive exercises and tools in a minute. Um, I had co-instructors in that course. So the great thing was that um, I have a, a co-instructor who is also a science writer. And what we would do is monitor the chat for each other. Um, and also, we would interject. We would interrupt each other and like tell a story or you know, have a little bit of a dialogue just to keep it lively, to again, to seem like real people, that we were having a conversation. Um, if you have a TA in the course, they can also serve that role of kind of keeping a dialogue going and not having it just be lecture. Really important to give breaks. And so I was, um, we had the students in this class, it was 17 students. We had them all keep their video cameras on for the class. And I was kind of watching the, the, the students on video while my uh, co-instructor was lecturing one day and we had run a little bit past when we had said that we would give the students a break. It was, we were teaching a two hour block. So we always try to give a break at an hour. Um, and I could see the students just wilt. So they were just dying to have that break. And, and so it's very important to consider that they need that break. Um, we did ask the students to leave their videos on because I, uh, I don't know about you, but if I turn a video off, I am tempted to multitask. And so I think um, making the students keep their videos on, they're more likely to stay present. Um, I like to cold call on students. Um, however, I am terrible at remembering student names. And so it's harder for me in a regular in-person class to call on students because I will uh, sometimes not be able to uh, get the name right. Um, but on Zoom, it's great because everybody has their name right there. So you can actually cold call on students and that helps to keep them responsible for staying engaged. Um, the final thing is you got to be flexible. We were flexible when we did this, uh, this course and we, we kept changing things as we went along because we watched the student reactions on Zoom. We could kind of see how it was going over or not going over and we tried to like change things on the fly. And I think you have to again be a little bit of humor and, and be flexible. All right, so what I wanted to do now is actually to try a little interactive poll using a tool called Mentimeter. And so how this works is you can go to your internet or your phone, internet, and type in menti.com, and you're going to enter a code. The code is 9916593. And this is going to pop up a poll question that we're all going to answer in real time here. Um, I, I'm just trying to come up with a fun question. So I'm curious, because I know I do this, uh, during a typical Zoom meeting or whatever your equivalent is, 
Um, about what percent of time do you spend multitasking when it's a bigger meeting, you know, with missing maybe more than five people in it, like checking email. So I want you to now take about 30 seconds, have everybody go to menti.com, enter that code, uh, and then we'll get the results in, in real time. And somebody please let me know uh, if there's any problems with the poll. I am now popping up the results so we can see it in real time. <laughs> so as you'll notice, uh, I'll let people have a little bit more time to actually find this and, and enter, and then we can talk about the results. All right, just an interest of time here. You can keep entering it if you are, are still uh, getting to menti.com. Um, but you can see it's kind of fun to do these polls in real time because uh, we're, our average here is running at about 40%. I must say my average is higher than that. Um, I am more guilty of this than that. Um, but the polls are kind of nice because you can see it's showing you that we actually have a wide range of densities there. <laughs> and there's a wide range of what people put for those answers. Uh, good thing to keep in mind that students will multitask too if they have their videos off. Um, uh, you can use these kinds of polls to again try to keep students engaged. Um, this is Mentimeter. It's a free tool. Uh, there is a paid version, but there's also a free version. And um, you can use Mentimeter also for doing word clouds and other types of polls. And so, for example, in my writing course uh, recently, we I gave the students a paragraph to read. And then they go to Mentimeter, they had to enter a few words to describe the writing. It was a very academic, very dry uh, writing piece. Um, I was doing this um, with my class and my daughter became so interested, she said, she came by and said, oh, mom, can I do this too? And so she participated in the exercise. Too. We also used Google Docs, just, you know, basic Google Docs is very good. Uh, we, I posted some paragraphs and we had all 17 students go to Google Docs and highlight the words that they found to be jargon. Um, Whiteboards are great for doing equations. Both the instructor and the students can write on the whiteboard. Obviously, this is not going to work well for a class of 100 or more, but for a smaller class. Um, I'm showing you here my, my daughter was doing uh, a math problem with my mom over Zoom recently using a whiteboard. So I, I've compiled a list of, this is by no means uh, comprehensive, but just a list of some of the online tools you can use for these types of interactive exercises, Poll Everywhere, Google Docs, a number of whiteboards, Google Jamboard. Again, um, you can, we'll, we'll provide these links later, so you don't have to, I'm not gonna go through them all, but there's a lot of tools out there that are pretty easy to use. A lot of them are free that you can do these kinds of interactive exercises to keep things lively, particularly in a synchronous uh, lecture. Um, like all of you, I am worried now about thinking about how to take the active learning component, what I usually do in class, and translate that um, for this remote learning. And so just a few ideas there. Um, one thing I think John also mentioned, there is a treasure trove of real world statistics examples in the news right now. So those make great activities for active learning. There is so much on COVID that you can find. Um, if you're not up to say Twitter is a really good source for examples, I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, what we would normally do is in, in class I would have students work together, discuss a problem, talk about this is a new story. Um, the equivalent in Zoom is to use breakout rooms. And as I mentioned before, we do a lot of code diagnosis. And so what I've found for my spring and summer courses that worked really well is my TA and I offered multiple remote office hours. We would get about three to five students they can share their screen and show the code. And usually that was a good number because if one student had trouble with a particular part of the code, um, it usually the other students also have the same trouble. So we could usually help about three to five students at once. All right, just a, a couple of examples of the things I would normally do with active learning that I will translate uh, you know, for remote learning. Um, so I might take an article from the popular media. So this was one that was in 538.com a couple years ago about how many football players have CTE. The students can read this article, it's just a popular media article, uh, but it linked to a journal article in neurology. And this journal article was just a simple one page article. I used it in an intro stats course. They were trying to estimate the prevalence of this brain disease CTE in professional football players. 
And there was one figure in that paper, and all it was doing was estimating that prevalence using one unknown parameter. What happens if that parameter is anywhere from zero to 100? So what I had the students do in groups was actually to figure out what is the mathematical equation, the algebraic equation that they are using there to draw that graph. And then these were intro students, and so they're just learning R, um, and I had them go into R and actually produce that graphic, which was a challenge for them because they're just learning. That's the kinds of things that you can do. The equivalent here will be to do this in great numbers. Um, there are so many great ready-made statistics lessons on Twitter. Here's one I picked up just this week. So you probably all heard about the convalescent plasma and the, the errors in that. Um, and somebody had actually done a thread and they said, hey, it's a great lesson for a statistics class. And so you can go through their thread and there's a lot of material there that you can just pick up uh, to use this for discussion in class. Um, Melinda is going to talk about assessments, so I won't spend much time on assignments and exams, but just a few tips there. Um, I do all of my homeworks are auto graded and so that saves my TA and I quite a bit of time. Um, I do things like I like to have them actually analyze data and then I will ask them to, you know, put in to the auto grader certain parameters. So what was the correlation coefficient, for example. So be a little careful with the auto grading that you build in sufficient tolerance for rounding and are clear about how you want those answers entered as a decimal or a percent or whatever it might be. I also really like to have my students do graphing. And so the way I've handled that with the auto grader is I um, do it as multiple choice. And so I make a couple of decoy graphics, three decoy graphics, where I change a few data points. So therefore, they have to actually graph it to get the right graph, um, but it can be auto graded. If your software allows, um, uh, I allow my students to work together on all homework assignments. And what I do there is to offer multiple versions of the question randomly assigned where I change a few of the numbers so they can work together, but then everybody has to go back and answer the question themselves and calculate for their own numbers. Um, I'm a fan of open book exams, and I think for the remote learning situation, to the extent you can make things open book, is gonna be easier. Uh, you can do that by asking questions that require students to think or do, rather than just, you know, fit something back. Um, and I'm still trying to include some assessments that are graded offline so they feel like they get some personal feedback. Uh, just my parting thought here, I think education has been moving in this direction towards more online, more remote learning uh, for a while now. Uh, and I think the pandemic is just going to kick us there faster, and I actually think that that's uh, potentially a really good thing. All right, thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you for all the resources, especially um, the overhead slide projector. I do remember that. And your, yeah, and your journey with technology sounds very familiar, actually, yeah. And so I would like to remind our um, audience that the all the resources, all the slides that our speakers are uh, providing, they will be available at nist.org within a day or so. And I would like to encourage all our uh, participants to submit their questions through the Q&A uh, future at the bottom of your Zoom window. And with that, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Melinda Clardy, who is an assistant professor of mathematics at South Louisiana Community College. Uh, as the online course lead, she has been a part of the uh, ever-growing online instruction group at this college. In addition, as a member and then the chair of the Academic Standards Committee, Melinda is a longtime advocate for strict policy and procedures surrounding academic integrity. Today, Melinda will share uh, her experiences with online teaching, talk about how to maintain academic integrity, and she will tell us a little bit about uh, being tough while being fair. Melinda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. So I know everybody's getting a little bit fatigued. We've got that hour break thing that we really want, but I promise I won't be too, too long with you. So uh, as long as everybody can see, we wanna strive to be tough but fair. Um, it's a balance that I've always tried to get in my classes. And this was something that I was worried about even before we made the move to online. So um, some of the things that we want to point out, uh, my background, uh, as I am teaching at a community college, I'm not as, um, you know, rigorous as some of you guys have to be, but I think it does lend a little bit of color to the information. So I'm not only coming from a statistics background, but also different algebra and trigonometry classes, which have to be taught at a different level. So uh, statistics is my game at my school. I'm the stats person. <laughs> so it's the only course that I've taught fully asynchronous online. Um, 
So that's the one that I have the most information for. There's tons of factors that go into whether or not your students are successful in these courses. So I'm just going to share some of my observations and my recent success story. So the most common problems that I see in like an algebra based class or trigonometry class is apps uh, such as Mathway or Photomath. So if you're teaching a lower level class or you have a lot of uh, multiple choice kind of questions, this is going to be a problem for you because it's, it's so easy to ask a question that has a numerical answer in a math class. That's what you expect, honestly. And the problem becomes that those are very easy to get the answer to from external resources. So the more that you can require your students to use their critical thinking skills, the more you're going to be able to assess whether or not they're actually doing their own work. So this has been a big struggle for me. Uh, sites like Course Hero and Chegg have become very prevalent. Uh, <laughs> During the pandemic, when we made the move to remote, I saw the number of results for questions asked daily on any given topic double or even triple in some cases. On an average weekday, you would usually see about 20 pages of results, and that moved up to 50 or even 70 on some days. And that was uh, very telling to me that too many people were feeling that pressure, that they needed to succeed, and the only way to do that was to use someone else's information. And so today, I want to help you guys maybe see a couple of ways to protect yourself and also to help protect your students from going down that path in the first place. So this is all going to be something that helps us to um, add randomization, you know, add personalization, all the things that uh, John and Kristen have already talked about, which is so awesome. So um, let's, uh, let's see what we've got. <laughs> Free response is my big fallback. Um, I am fortunate enough to only have classes with uh, 30 or less. So I understand that this is uh, much more difficult when we're talking about um, very, very large classes. But in general, I find that this makes them communicate more clearly, especially in something like statistics, your numbers are not meaningless. You really have um, a depth of information that that value gives you. It tells you something about the distribution. It tells you something about that real world situation. So making them use their words is not only going to help them be a better statistician and student, it's going to help you understand if something is lacking from their information or whether their information is coming from another source. If I see two identical sentences, that's much less likely than two identical numerical answers. So this is telling me that something maybe a little off color is happening there. And it means that if I do submit, um, you know, some kind of academic sanction as a result of that, that my, um, my reasoning behind that is much stronger because I can see more information lining up than just, as I said, a numerical answer. So, um, this is my righteous quest, academic integrity. The problem that we face is that most textbooks are already published online somewhere. You know, every time a new edition comes out, there's this scramble to add all of the questions, all the variations, uh, if you're using some kind of randomization software, and it's very quick. It happens so, so fast. If a student uploads a question, they'll get a quote unquote expert answer usually within the hour, often less than half an hour. So this makes a time test um, ineffective as your only countermeasure for using these kinds of tools. So the more that you can randomize your values, the more that you can protect yourself, the less likely it is that your work is going to end up there. But if you ask challenging questions, unmotivated or stressed students are going to take advantage of those sites eventually. It is only a matter of time in my experience. So what we want to do is also use those tools to our advantage when we can. Chegg is the course that I've had the most, uh, or not the course, but the site I've had the most experience with. It's the one that I think most students have heard about. Um, so once your material does end up on those sites, there are uh, paths for recourse. You can address the Chegg team and get your material taken down. You can flag things as being your intellectual property. And I'm given to understand the process is a little lengthy, but it does mean that that won't be there for forever on the internet. Um, and the more important part to me is finding who did this. It's not that I feel a sense of vindication or anything by taking someone down. I'm not into the cops and robbers of this. Um, but it means that that student is struggling in a way that I have not addressed yet. And I need to take action and in regard to that. So what I developed is a system for question ID tracking. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Just a very brief tutorial. 
Um, this is one of my questions. This was actually on my final exam earlier this summer. So you can imagine my heartbreak when I saw these little pictures there. Um, but when we look at this picture a little more closely, we can see in the URL that there is a, a Q number at the end. This is the ID number that's randomly um, assigned to the question as it is indexed by Chegg's website. So this uh, ID is present on all types of uh, questions. In this case, I'm focusing on the statistics library, and you can see that that's how it's sorted as well. You can see that path um, highlighted in the uh, questions archive. So when we go to this archive, what we see is a bank of questions going all the way back to the site's inception. And we can use uh, sorting algorithms to be able to narrow down our search. So once you understand what your question ID number looks like, you can use the assignment um, availability and submission times to be able to narrow down where you want to start looking. So perhaps you understand that your assignment was due on June 3rd. So most of the assignments uh, submissions are going to be in the days leading up to that. So you would start looking on, you know, June 1st, the very first entry. And if that Q number, that ID is far off of yours, then you know to move to maybe the next day and see whether or not that's gone beyond your question ID and use that to help narrow down your search. As I said, there are often 70 pages of results for these. So going down to a single day still leaves you quite an extensive search. Looking at the first result on the top of each page is going to help you to be able to narrow down which page you want to try to search because using uh, even the, you know, your browser's control F find phrase kind of situation isn't going to be enough to be able to track this often. So um, the question archive and that kind of sorting method, knowing that that question ID is there helped me immensely with this kind of um, tracking information. So I hope that that helps you as well. Um, the ideal situation that we all hope for is that our students will engage with the material, that they'll do their own work, and that they'll be successful in this course, uh, you know, achieving a passing grade or at least a grade equivalent to the work that they've done uh, whenever they decide to do it. So wishful thinking isn't enough to make it so <laughs> if, uh, you know, if ands and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas if your parents ever told you that growing up. Um, but I've found that the more comfortable that you can make your students with you as a person, the less comfortable they'll be in the ultimate betrayal that is academic dishonesty. So the more that you can increase that dialogue and increase that interactiveness, like John and Kristen were saying, the better off you're going to be as an instructor because you're going to have more successful students and you're going to have less cheating in my experience. So being able to reduce their stress, having that good personal relationship, and making yourself as available as possible makes you their better alternative to Google. This last semester, I uh, actually was very direct and told my students that if you try to search this material, you're ultimately going to end up just making yourself more confused and often worsening the situation you find yourself in because there's so much information out there and everybody's perspective on something is a little bit different, especially with something like statistics where hey, if I sanitize my data a little different than you do or if I round a little differently than you do, suddenly our answers um, several steps down the line become much, much different. And it's important for them to understand that some of these shortcuts are you know, not being taken by us or not relevant. So making sure that you um, make yourself available to try to answer the questions that match up with your curriculum and your um, objectives for your students is going to help them to reach out to you rather than just trying to filter through all of that themselves and ultimately end up with disappointment. But of course, you have to make sure that you're careful that you don't overstress yourself trying to answer questions just constantly. I know John was addressing this. When you have many, many students, it becomes very difficult for you to answer individual emails. So if you want to set up a Q&A discussion, that's one way you can deal with that. I find having um, a set time of day where I stop answering emails, um, but still encourage them to come in so that I can answer them in the morning uh, was a good balance for me. And of course, you'll have to find your own. My success story was my synchronous online class this summer. I, I taught two classes synchronously this summer and one asynchronously. In my asynchronous class, I had over 25% of the student roster engage in some form of academic dishonesty, whether it be plagiarism or cheating. And that was astonishing to me because 
being a community college, we also have about 25% of the roster fail for non-participation. So that means that a third of the students who were actively engaging in the class decided to engage in such a way that was ultimately underhanded. Um, but this summer, uh, setting those clear guidelines at the beginning, telling them to, you know, let me be their Google filter and just showing my face, uh, meeting with them and joking with them and making that interpersonal bond ultimately meant that I had far, far less of my uh, student roster engaging in this kind of behavior. So I only had one student who decided to do, um, you know, something of this nature. And that student was extremely apologetic when addressed about it. They said they were just stressed about their exam because they had, you know, lost um, power with some flooding we had here and everything. And while regrettable, it was more understandable than the usual situation that they found themselves in. So that was very encouraging to me. Um, so we had that video communication and I introduced a new type of assignment this semester that I think is uh, also a big key to my success, which was completion based grading. So my usual class structure involves mastery based homework um, that comes from the publishing company we use Hawks, um, but ultimately it's um, a self grading uh, assignment, they have to reach a certain threshold in order to receive credit for the assignment and they can take it as many times as they need, which helps relieve some of the pressure on the student to get it right the first time. Um, but the supplementary activities that I would put in, I could only set them to be available so many times. So I would you know, usually, give, usually give them two or three attempts at them, and they would have more of the free response questions that I discussed earlier. And they would be very similar in structure to the exams that would be sent uh, out later. So in addition to this format this semester, I went with a very low tech option, which was to give a worksheet that I would have administered in an in-class um, section and let them do that to the best of their ability. If they put something for every question, they received 100% for that assignment. And if they finished, you know, half of it, they got 50%. And it didn't matter whether their answers were right or wrong. It was that the effort was there and that the approach they were taking was consistent with what we had discussed in class. So at the end of each of those assignments, I gave individual feedback to the students to say whether or not they had done the actual process correctly and whether their answer was um, in fact correct. And this took the pressure off of the students to be able to get the answers that they were looking for and made it more about the process. And I saw greater test results uh, as a as a as a follow through with these students was engaged because they saw those questions and went, oh, I don't know what I'm doing yet. <laughs> I better you know, research this some more or ask more questions. And by the time they got to the um, supplementary activities and the exams, they had their process down. And it was very encouraging to see that going on in a standard in-class section of my interest statistics class, I usually have about a 60% pass rate, um, including Ds. And in a standard online, I'm lucky to make it to 40%. So I was able to split the difference between those this time, and that was um, heaps better than I had had before. So that was very um, encouraging. So if I had to try to talk to somebody who's just starting out in online or, or just finding their feet, or maybe just wants to try to do something a little bit differently, mastery-based learning definitely takes the pressure off of them. If you can offer a few completion-based grades, it helps them to do a kind of self-check without feeling that pressure to get it 100% right. And it, it opens that line of communication. So it makes them want to talk to you about what's going on. Those free response questions can be very challenging and understanding what that you want is also very helpful. So I'm going to say some of the same things that, you know, you've already heard today. Try to make a video breaking it down. I found that if I had um, a step-by-step -step how to do this question uh, and what kind of answers are appropriate to a free response question of that type, it meant that they had not necessarily a script to follow, but at least some kind of footprints to be able to step along the same path appropriately. And it doesn't have to be something that you make yourself. There are a ton of um, video libraries out there. If you can find one that's similar in style to your teaching, I think you'll find that that can really help. I know uh, Math is Power for You is a really good one. A lot of my colleagues use that one. Um, and he has very bite-sized videos already prepared and it just, it helps if you want to address a question that you've answered a million times. It's a pat answer that you can send without having to extend yourself and, and do something extra as well. Because our time is also valuable. As much as we want our students to be successful, we can't do it for them. 
so this gives you a way to help them learn independently as well as you know giving them that extra nudge um, and as Kristen was saying there's so much technology the office suite is your basic you know uh, if you can get what you need out of it that can really help if you don't have access to a randomization software like we have with our publishing company, you can actually use the Microsoft mailings to be able to make random values for your exams. You would make a spreadsheet with values for even each individual student can get a different number if you want them to. And then use the mailings to be able to put those together into a test. It's very straightforward to set up. There's a wizard for it, which is always great. Uh, it takes you back to like Clippy, if you remember that in the original Microsoft Word. Um, but in general, it's uh, a low tech solution that everybody has access to that solves a big problem when it comes to math, um, making sure that there is enough difference in the material that each student has to work on it individually, even if they should choose to collaborate or look at these external resources. Um, it's also really good for documenting. So if they don't notice those subtle differences in the <laughs> in the exams and they choose to copy off of someone else it just makes sure that you can say well these aren't your answers but they are sally's so that's going to be a problem for you and for sally now <laughs> again it's just also about making what you're doing that much more straightforward and it makes it really clear to the students that they're going to have to meet these expectations that you're setting and that's the tough part right that you have these high expectations but the fair part is that you're welcome to ask any questions that you have and I'm going to help you find your way. And I found that that's a good balance for me and I hope that that helps you in your experience. The biggest advice that I can give is to search your own questions online and that'll tell you when things start to go sideways and you can start to take that course correction, whether it be the question ID tracking or looking at your randomized values and saying, well, who is the one who had these values and, and having that discussion with them to make sure that they get back on track. So that's my advice for how to be tough but fair. And I hope to hear from you guys all in the Q&A. Thank you. OK, thank you, Melinda, so much, um, especially for all the information you gave us for how to design our assessments. And I didn't know that much about Chegg, actually. Thank you so much for all yeah. that information as well. OK, so um, maybe uh, you can stop, I think, sharing. Oh, yes, sorry so much and i'm going to start with a question for you actually um how quickly will exam questions show up in Chegg? if an exam opens for four days can questions show up that fast yes absolutely um so in my experience the final exam that was posted over the summer um the answer was submitted for them within 30 minutes so like the, the student posted within 30 minutes they had an answer and it was searchable on google within two hours so other students could then find that link to be able to just go to it without having to ask the question themselves. Wow, that is fast. I was like, that is really fast. <laughs> yeah, that is really fast. Yeah. Um, one question, I think this is for um, all of our speakers. Um, so there are a lot of good ideas here, but many of us do not have the technology to present step-by-step -step material involving equation development with a digital pen and simultaneously appear on the screen. So do you have any suggestions for technology, if, especially for people who doesn't have access to um, some of these technological tools? And if anyone wants to start, go ahead. And I think um, obviously to, to be able to write, to be able to um, share digitally and have the video, you're gonna have to have some, some version of something. Um, I mean, a simple, an iPad with the, with, the, with the new pens is very powerful and able to uh, share and integrate with Zoom. When, when, you, uh, when you want to share your screen, you can actually do a connection to your iPad um, and then write on it. I know I use that. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's, obviously there's, there's, there's some amount that, that should be created. Um, Zoom in itself, I don't know if your university has that or, or if you create your own account. Um, I think Kristen's mentioned it, but uh, it's an easy way to make a video. Um, it can show your can show your face as well um, while you're doing the, the slideshow. Yeah, I think Zoom uh, gives you an opportunity if you have access to, to recording on Zoom. You just press the record button. You can have your face and your slideshow, or talk over anything else. The internet, whiteboard doesn't have to be the slideshow too. So, yeah. 
Uh, when I was in school, there was somebody who was kind of pioneering an online program for us. And he honestly just put up a tripod in a classroom and wrote on the whiteboard. And I mean, it got the job done. So that's a low tech way to be able to do something like that. Um, the Microsoft Office Suite also has a voice recording function to be able to type what you're saying for you. So that would be a way for you to be able to deliver a bunch of like definitions, especially in a way that they can watch unfold in front of them without having to have that pen technology as well. One of the links that I posted was to a YouTube video where somebody made their own light board. So it does require you buying some, uh, you know, big piece of plastic. <laughs> uh, but they were writing on that with their face behind it and just taping it, say, with an iPhone. And so uh, I recommend that so your colleague of mine pass that on to me. It's it's well done, and I think it's a little bit of do it yourself, but um, you know, affordable and low tech. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, I have one question for Kristen about the Mentimeter meter. Um, so you mentioned about making a word cloud and showing the mean, but um, can we show standard deviation or other measures of spread? That is a great question. I don't think any of the, I haven't tried all of the tools in there, so there might be something buried that I haven't tried yet. Um, the, most of the polls I've seen that like the one where you slide the scale, it just shows you the mean. It does show the density in the background, so you get a sense of that, but it doesn't produce that value unfortunately so it might be a good suggestion for them especially for the stats course <laughs> or you can down you can download the data and then you can have your staff students calculate that so it does produce data that's downloadable oh that's great that's great that you can download the data i think you can do a lot of things once you have the data um so this is a question that i think it i have a uh, i have another question linked to this but first uh let me ask you guys are pre-recorded lectures better than written worksheets that also have pauses to solve problems? So what do you think of like pre-recorded versus having worksheets that have pauses to uh, solve problems? Or do you have a preference, I guess, maybe pre-recorded versus recorded? I, I think Kristen mentioned this a little bit in her talk. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that you can pre-record things that are uh, didactic lectures, you know, that I think is helpful. And as Melinda said, you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. You may be able to find some good material on YouTube that you can point students to. So don't be afraid to take what's already out there and don't recreate the wheel. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, is it a pre-recorded lecture versus a worksheet? Those would be, you know, different purposes, right? So the worksheet would be to practice. Um, the lecture would be to show you how to do something. So I guess the advantage of the pre-recorded lecture is you could then explain the answer, whereas the worksheet might only have that written down and not you know, somebody talking you through it. I think you could easily marry the ideas though if you wanted to. Um, perhaps give them a worksheet ahead of time and then release a video of you talking through what should have gone in that worksheet to still make it a learning experience if you don't have the ability to pre-record like when we had to make the transition to online very fast. Yeah, I think that's that's something you have to weigh um, how you're going to deliver the content or new content, because if you do have to rapidly move online, pre-making the videos will probably take you more time than if you um, just meet or say I'm delivering a lecture at. I kind of treat it as I'm going to record this video for you. If you want to show up and watch it live, you can do that, but it will also be available recorded um, because when making the pre mid pre uh, pre made videos, you'll find yourself doing more of the editing or trying to make it perfect. You might have more videos and now you're managing the storage and where they're located and how they're shared. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go into it. So it's really on the It really goes back to that time aspect as well. <laughs> Just keep in mind that you only have to stay like one day ahead of the students though. So when I first did some of my courses, I was taping, you know, the week before that lecture went to the student. So it's okay if you're, you don't have them all pre-recorded, you can kind of just do some and try to, you know, just stay uh, just a little bit ahead of the student. Yeah, our participant has uh, edit, has clarified the question more. And um, the question is verbal lecture versus written, which is more passive. Um, maybe another aspect, if you have um, any other insights to that, if you want to add something to this. I guess for some concepts, written will be better just to uh, enforce some of the concepts, but you would want to give it maybe most probably like verbal at the beginning and then do maybe additional worksheets to enforce the um, concepts. I don't know whether you guys agree. 
I mean, I do have some students who, who get transcripts of all the pre-recorded lectures who actually read the transcript rather than watching the lecture. I'd say that was the minority of students who like to do it that way. So for some, that's very efficient. They'd rather read it. And some students are better auditory learners and they would rather hear it. So, um, you know, if you pre-record the lectures, you can actually provide the transcript as well for those. I think it's a minority of students who would rather learn it that way. Yeah, and I, I do think there's something powerful about um, in quantitative courses, especially like statistics, where you see the verbal and the visual. So either you writing it out digitally while you're speaking about it, um, or you just use your PowerPoint animations and you're releasing like a section at a time um, and then talking about that as it's, as it's being put out there. So it's kind of both. Yeah. Okay, so one question I have for John, I think this is gonna be more of a clarification. Um, so all our, uh, our participant says that all my experiences with online courses is that structure is good, a schedule, deadlines, a clear map of where we're going, where we're heading. Um, I think in your talk, maybe this message got, um, didn't go, uh, maybe it needs to be clarified. You seem to imply that it, it makes it less personal. What do you think of this? No, that's a, that's a perfect question. And I think what you have to understand is the tracks. The transactional distance theory does not take into account instructor time. Um, it's, un, it's as if unlimited. So obviously, so if you think about the smallest, the lowest part of that, the least transactional distance is an independent study with a student where you work with them to decide on what they want to do. So now I'm faced with a class of 300. So I have not the capability to do that. So now my structure has to increase. And that's not a bad thing but the transactional distance will, will increase as well with that um, because the students are, you know, have to look at the structure that I've already set up in the LMS and I'm not, I'm not going to email them every single thing that we have to do. They have to have some autonomy to go in and look and you absolutely have to structure. Um, and like you said, and I, so I think that's a, that's a good distinction to make. And, and I didn't mean to say it or come across um, in the, in that manner. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. And if our, um, if there's, there was anything that wasn't clear, I would welcome more questions that I could forward to John. Um, let me see. And um, so we have a uh, participant who's teaching continuing education courses in biostatistics uh, for professionals who analyze health surveys. In-class presentations are two to three days from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you, uh, there are no grades or exams for these classes. So if you have any suggestions of how to teach these courses, um, please feel free to share. So I, I, yeah, I was going to say yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe about the, the, something that's normally delivered in person all day. <laughs> how do you yeah. translate that for the remote? So I've done some longer workshops online since we've all gone remote. Um, some of the same things that I said in my talk, making sure to give breaks and keeping it interactive. If you're dealing with data analysis, this might be, if it's small enough, this might be a great opportunity to have students go into breakout rooms and actually, you know, pop up R. This is the great thing about Zoom. You can all have R or, or SAS or whatever your program is up on your computer. Um, you can share your screen so you can talk about the code. It makes it pretty easy. Um, so I would suggest, you know, doing a lot of hands-on data analysis if, if that's normally part of the course and something that can be, uh, the students can work on together. Uh, yeah, because a whole day of lectures is not going to fly. <laughs> I would say another thing you could do if you do have a larger class would be to have them pre-record their own presentation, whether that be, you know, uploading it to YouTube or putting it into a shared drive of some kind. And then you could break down the grading for that by having students peer review other people to make sure that the students are still engaging with those presentations as well. Right. Um, thank you all. And uh, we have one uh, question. How do you solve time difference issues when a good number of your students in the class are from a very different remote region? Especially, I think we all experience these problems when students move back to home um, to do their online teaching, uh, online classes. Yeah, we're, we uh, were just discussing this uh, the other day with, with some faculty because we have a lot of these instances right now, um, you know, students, you know, completely on the other side of the world, like 12 hour time differences and how do you deal with that? Um, and you have to, you know, what are, are you gonna be flexible with the time difference or 
is there going to be some sort of um, maybe some sort of lecture check or quiz that your in-class students might already do, but you have it open that somebody could take it at a different time um, or, you know, or asynchronously after they watch your maybe recording of the, uh, of the lecture where they can't necessarily, because they can't necessarily be there live because it would just be in the, in the middle of the night. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, thinking about your due dates or due times, whether they be, a lot of people are just 1159 or whatever, but, you know, does it matter if they turn it in at 2 a.m.? Because are you going to grade it at 201? Um, you know, can you make your due date eight in the morning? You know, does that make a difference? You know, so those kind of things um, can also be thought about. I think offering office hours at some off times too is one thing that um, we did in the spring is, you know, a 7 p.m. or a 7 a.m. Um, and my TAs actually like that because they like doing the, the, not during their normal school time, but on their off hours. So they were happy to do that for students who were far away so that everybody could have an office hour to attend. Right, I think making stuff available online, recording the classes and trying to be uh, available office hours is the key to reach all our students. So we have a question from Melinda. I think the Chegg uh, presentation you gave attracted a lot of uh, uh -huh. attention. Yeah. Um, so since the exams appear, uh, exams answers appear on Chegg within 30 minutes and Google within four hours, how do you know that the exam with randomization was done by the student and not another person? How do you grade the questions with your randomization methods? Okay, that's a great question. So um, when I write the questions myself, I make sure to add quite a bit of randomization in different layers where you might not expect it. So I don't know if it, you guys were paying attention to the question that was posted there, but I gave my character a name, not just like your friend or whatever. So if you make weird names or if you make names that randomize, that'll help you pin down kind of when that question uh, appeared and, and who had it. So if you have two layers of randomization, like the characters and the variables themselves, then that's gonna help it make it more, you know, statistically strong once you find a match in your students, say like, yes, this is this person. And if you're writing your questions yourself, you don't have to worry about anybody else muddling with your data. Like if it was shared with a colleague or something like that, then you won't have to, you won't be able to pin it down quite as strongly without at least talking to that colleague. But, that's, of course, up to your administrators on how you have to share your materials. So. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, again, um, one of our participants asks for, um, he has a long experience in teaching uh, where he used to go to studio and record uh, using a VHS tape. Uh, the final product would always set a talking head in one of the corners of my slides. And I think we all experience that when you're trying to record through Zoom. Um, and there are other ways they get the personal me. Uh, and then what do you guys think about like having this talking head when you're actually doing this presentation? So how could we make it more personal rather than just students seeing the slide and then just our head? So Ezra, in all my pre-recorded lectures, I appear at the beginning <laughs> for about five seconds <laughs> where I say, hi, this lecture is going to be about X, and then I disappear. And partly it was for just for my own, uh, it's easier when you're taping the lecture to not have to worry about like looking at the camera and, you know, your hair. And so like I would just appear at the beginning so they knew who I am, but then I take myself out of the rest of the video. And I think it's been just fine that they don't really feel they need my head there. Uh, during the rest Agreed. of the video. Yeah, I'm much the same, um, especially because I have a two-in-one laptop. So to write on my screen, I would just be pointing my camera at the sky anyway. So I come in, I say hi, and then I go into the actual math and then maybe pop back in at the second, if, uh, at the end, if I feel like something needs clarification or if I want to really encourage them to ask questions because it's a complex topic. Yeah, I agree with both of them. It's not really needed after a certain point. I think, I think early on, whether you do an intro video or something like that, just to kind of put a, a face and voice to, to, to your name, um, like in the LMS or whatever, it's useful. But after that, you don't need to keep having it there. Right, just a floating head instead of that, I guess just seeing the slides might be a better idea. Um, we have one question that um, John mentioned using Google Docs. Uh, one of our participants is using uh, Zoom breakout rooms. So do you recommend using Zoom breakout rooms to Google Docs or how to make it work, how to make the, I think how to make the breakout rooms work actually. Um, I think, 
I think what they're asking, I'm not sure, is when they're in breakout rooms, how can you see what they're working together on? Exactly, right. Um, I, yeah. And so that could be done. Yeah, absolutely could be done. Google Docs, you could set it up yourself where, uh, like, or, or if your university already has those, um, like if you have access to Google through your university account, then all your students would too. And maybe that's Office 365 as well. And you could actually have them share a document that way um, and then easily share you with it. Um, or you could actually create the Google Docs yourself, give each one, um, each group a link um, and, and have them go to that doc to submit their work. Um, you could also, there's some tools for, um, I don't have to, don't ask me the names, but I know there's some online markdown editors. Like if you're, if you're uh, want to do it that way, um, if, especially if it's more computational heavy or, or maybe LaTeX um, editors. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some collaborative tools out there that you could have students, or you could also have students maybe submit something as a group into, uh, into the LMS as well. I think those are great ideas because I had one, I had a question like that too in my mind. If you, you want to do breakout rooms so that they do some group, group work, but you also want to know what's going on in those breakout rooms. And I think that's a great idea. Belinda, do you have something to add? Maybe I was just going to say uh, track changes in Word is an amazing tool. I had a group project that they turned in and each of their writing was highlighted in a different color. So I could see who was doing the most of the work and that kind of thing to, to see those changes happen live. So. That's a great idea. Um, let me see. So um, another question we have is, I constantly worry about cheating. I think we're all there. We all agree with that. Uh, and um, I think after seeing Chegg, some people became more concerned. And uh, But one advantage in statistics is that it is easy to change a number slightly. The mean is 4.7 and now it's 4.3. Um, our uh, participant opens his exam for several days and the students decide when they started. Uh, he uses a random set of questions, but he's thinking about changing quite the questions slightly in the four day, four day window. Um, what do you think of that? So that like you open it with some set of questions and I think you change it over the course so that uh, maybe it won't end up the same question on Chegg or the Google? That's an I'm interesting sure. theory. So basically you would want to go in and edit the test live mm -hmm. while, while students are potentially taking it. And I think there's the danger about having equivalent questions there. But I think if you have a bank of equivalent questions that you feel comfortable swapping in, that would be a way to add some extra randomization. And you could even do that at the forefront to, um, you know, with clustered questions. I know Canvas can do those, um, that kind of thing, to be able to make sure that there's some automation in it. So you're not sitting there every two hours with an alarm on your phone, remembering to go change the test because you're worried about people cheating. There has to be a line in the sand for yourself as well. Um, the best of intentions will be ripped apart by students who are too stressed or, or just too driven to get 100% or whatever the case may be that motivates them. So you can't make yourself crazy worrying about it either. But I'd say the best balance for me, at least, was to make sure that I knew who did it when it was all said and done. And as long as you've got enough randomization at the beginning, you're going to be able to say that. Right. Yeah, I do see that we could take it maybe too far with trying to make sure they don't cheat. Right. I, I agree. Okay, so one last question that I have is how do you hold your office hours for large classes now that we are all online because I do know that during office hours if you're in office right you could have 10 students and you could just like I don't know you can encourage them to talk one at a time ask questions one at a time but it might be difficult to do it online so what do you guys think how do you hold your office hours and make sure that you answer everyone's questions and um, sort of keep it orderly as much as possible. Um, I can give my experience. I think with the, uh, now granted, I only have an intro stat course. So most of the students are not, you know, stat majors or anything like that. It's not an advanced course with, with a lot of questions. And so I do have a live Zoom time um, at a designated like two hours during the week um, where they can just pop in at any time. Um, I do enable the waiting room that way, if I'm working with a student who um, it's a personal issue or whatever they want to talk about, I can then, no one else can be, can jump in on that conversation until I enable them. Um, now, if I, if I find I'm just going over like a homework problem, I might let the other people 
uh, come in and listen as well because they might have the same question or I would ask the student obviously. Um, so that's how I kind of do it. But I, and I don't, even out of a large class, I don't get a lot of people, um, if rarely ever. Uh, you might end up getting the same people every week, the people that really need to have that um, face to face time or live time with somebody. But otherwise, they, um, they ask their questions because I use Piazza a lot. They just, they're, they're all week, they're throwing questions in there. So I, so I don't think it's, uh, it doesn't get bottlenecked then into that office hour time. Yeah, I mean, I have the same experience. My courses are not over 100, though. <laughs> but uh, I had maybe 80 in the spring, and we just offered a lot of office hours over the weekend. My TA offered you know, more than we would normally offer um, in person, and we would have people drop in, and sometimes it might be two students, but we never were overcrowded um, because you know the, there was a few students who need help, and then there's a few students who love to come to office hours and ask questions, and you get both types, and, and you see them frequently, um, and some of the other students you don't see as often. I encouraged email a lot. Um, I also use Remind, which is like a texting app where you can not exchange phone numbers. So they can send me a picture of whatever they're working on and be like, help. And I can answer that, you know, it, it, wherever I am, if I'm on my phone and I want to answer it, or I can save it. And I do have scheduled office hours where they can set an appointment if they want to do like a face-to-face -face meeting. But I find that in, in the most part, being able to show me the question they're working on and show me any work that they want to set was enough to be able to do those office hours remotely. So. So having also other venues that they could ask you questions would prevent that overcrowding and also, I guess, maybe they, they, there might not be any overcrowding too. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and I also like to want to add that I, I will stay on after my lecture for 30 minutes. Uh, I know some students have to leave because they might have another class or whatever, but, but this, you know, 20, 30 students hang around just to, you know, ask general questions there or listen to what other people are asking. Um, so that's kind of a you know, an opportunity there as well. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. All right. So we're just about out of time. Um, so I would like to thank all our speakers for all the information they gave. Um, it's going to be very helpful to everyone who's just starting to do this, including myself. And thank you for all the resources that you shared. Um, and I would also like to thank our attendees for joining in and asking questions. And following this webinar, you will receive a survey. So please provide your feedback um, and, and we, we do appreciate that. And finally, I hope everyone will participate in upcoming this events and have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you so much for attending and thank you again for our uh, speakers. Bye everyone.